Crowned with Oil Chapter 2 The Character of the Kingdom For the kingdom God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. Romans 14, 17 Jesus came to the world to set up the kingdom of heaven, not to banish the Romans from Jerusalem, but to banish the sin from the hearts of men. Because he walked in obedience and truly represented the Father in the earth, he came to direct confrontation with the world, the flesh, and the devil. He consistently refused to meddle with the kingdom of the world, even though he they came to him on one occasion and attempted to make him their king by force. My kingdom is not of this world, he said. John eighteen thirty six. He came to bring to earth a different kind of kingdom, the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God on earth. Some would try to make a distinction between the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God. Just take your concordance and look up these terms as used in the four Gospels. It becomes a self-evident that it is one and the same kingdom. The kingdom of God brought down from heaven to embrace the hearts of men. The principles upon which this kingdom would be established are the principles of righteousness, truth, meekness, and love. See him stand before Pilate. Representative, the most powerful of all, um, all empires up to that time, and see how he replied to the question, Are you in a king then? I said that I am a king. To this end was I born. For this cause came I into the world, that I should bear witness to the truth. It's on the Gospel, 1837. The kingdom of God is a righteousness. First and foremost, it is a kingdom of righteousness. For without righteousness, God is righteousness. God's righteousness, there can be no real peace. And without righteousness, peace, there can be no real joy in the hearts of men. Now, righteousness is a free gift to God. It comes to us by the workings of His grace. That as the sin has reigned unto death, even so might the grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. Romans 5 21. The kingdom of righteousness has invaded the kingdom of sin and death. There are many kinds of kings, rulers, and dictators both in the world and in the church, but over them all, there is a greater Contentate with the final authority, and this one is death. There's a short reign of glory and power, and it's all over. All laid down the crowns and the crown of at the throne of death. Kings in the church do the same. They may reign, they may rule the reign in splendor. Large followings bring the masses under their subjection, receive adoration and honor from the multitudes. But sooner or later, they themselves submit to the still greater potentate, even death. But when the kingdom of heaven is truly making inroads into the lives of men, God is starting to begin to reign in life because of working the cross in their lives. Righteousness is a menace to the hearts of men, and grace reigns through righteousness unto eternal life. Apart from a administration of righteousness by the Holy Spirit, there is no abiding foundation for peace, much less for joy. This order is generally reversed because, generally speaking, the kingdoms of the church are based on worldly principles. So it's a quest of the world. So it has become the cornerstone of our church gatherings. 
The music like the music of the world. It's designed to bring joy. The young people are caught up with the pleasures of the world. So we will incorporate worldly pleasures into our religious services. We'll have worldly music and worldly games in our church gatherings. And in this way, we can get more young people involved in our church activities. And they call it the joy of the Lord. In many cases, it is like the cracking of a thorns under a pot. Ecclesiastes 7, 6. Now, what is righteousness? The good works of the people? Not really. Christ Jesus is a made unto us righteousness. 1 Corinthians 1, 30. This puts the whole matter in an entire different light. To all to be good works, that's true. This is true. But they're not really righteous deeds in the sight of God, except they be the other working of Christ Himself in our midst. It's not it's 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 only as we are abiding in Christ that is righteousness revealed in our lives. Only as a Christ walks in his people, leading, motivating, energizing, and manifesting his own life, are we truly a manifestation of the righteousness of God in the earth. We might bring forth some very impressive programs, religious or otherwise. We might preach, evangelize, and get involved with all kinds of Christian outreaches, but if it is because of human zeal and not the fruit of the righteousness of Christ in our lives, if it is not because we are working together with God in the yoke of Christ, all these wonderful works are but as a filthy rags in the sight, and we are will nothing in the daily Christ. Righteousness and peace. Then judgment or justice shall dwell in the wilderness, and righteousness shall remain in the fruitful field, and the work of righteousness shall be peace, and the effect of righteousness, quietness, and assurance forever. Isaiah 32, 16, and the 17. When peace becomes our pursuit, we can very easily build the kingdom of peace based on our own efforts. We see it in the world about us. We are also rampant in the church. The spirit compromised as a world of God's people. It seems necessary to survive for survival. God help us to discern the thoughts and the intentions of our hearts. Do our motives spring from the indwelling Christ? Or are we compromising the truth for the sake of unity? This is came not to send peace, but the sword. Matthew 10, 34. He came to do justice, to establish righteousness, and peace will be the fruit of it. But this will bring confrontation with the world about us. Friends against friend, brother against brother, father against son, mother against daughter, mother-in-law against daughter-in-law. This is inevitable. Because the kingdom of God is based on righteousness. The wisdom that comes from above is the first pure, then peaceable. James 3.17 Gentle and easy to be entreated. It is not harsh and cruel, but neither can it be compromising. It must first be pure. True peace will come out of this. True gentleness and meekness will come out of this. The pure in heart will see God. It will manifest and show forth the love, the mercy, and the gentleness of Christ. In the midst of it all, it will know God's grave. Because the sin is a people. I will allow righteousness and hate iniquity. And this is deed. As Jesus did. And a joy. And joy in the Holy Ghost. It seems to me that the kingdom that prevails out there in the church today is very much like the world. It is a 
kingdom based on joy. Who denied that God wants the people to have the joy of the world, the joy of the Lord? But joy is the fruit of the Spirit. Joy is the fruit that grows from the wine of truth, that of righteousness. You know, something you try to produce with a lot of good, snappy music. It's not manufactured by the mechanics of praise the worship. It is not the enthusiasm, excitement, and excitement. That generated by an entertainer who knows how to stir the emotions, but does not draw the heart to brokenness and repentance. It is the oil of joy that flow from the olive berry that is known the crushing and the pressing in the wants of God's dealings. It is the joy of Sarah who calls her newborn son laughter, Isaac, Isaac, <laughs> because it's God's fruitfulness in bringing fruitfulness and blessing to a woman of ninety, when the lamb bemoaned her state of barrenness before Abraham and before the Lord. Excuse me. It is the joy of Hannah. Who likewise knew sorrow of heart and much reproach, because he was a hope, helplessly barren. But she came to the place where she could rejoice in the God who brings down the high and the mighty, and exalts the lowly, who bring desolation those who gloried in their fruitfulness, and causes a barren woman to be a mother of a seven. It's a joy for Joseph. Whose feet were laid in fetters, and whose soul was laid in iron, but who, in the fulfillment of God's dealings, his life wept over his brother, his brethren, with the tears of joy and victory. I rejoice in the sovereign workings of God in his life, in the God who gave the oil of joy for mourning, for mourning. It is joy for Paul, who saw himself happy to be bound in chains, yet knowing he was free, because he knew he was a prisoner of the Lord. Happiness is not a feeling that comes and goes because of the circumstances. It is not something you have to work out when you come to church after a long miserable week and your job. It is an abiding state of blessedness that is yours in the midst of the trial, in the midst of the pressure, because you know that you are walking with God and doing His will, and reigning in life by Christ Jesus. Christ reigns as a priest on the throne. The kingdom to come is said to be that which Christ will establish when He comes back again, in which will enforce righteousness in the earth by righteous decree. God wants to minister righteous decrees in this manner, and exacted worse severe penalties upon all who disobeyed His laws. And the final outcome, if at all, was death. Paul. Went so far as to see that the whole administration of the Old Test, Old Covenant, was an administration with death. Second Corinthians three, seven. Not because there was anything wrong with the law itself, but in the outcome of it all, a broken law was inevitable because of the wickedness of the flesh, and which ought to have ministered life brought about. Administration for death. Now we are taught that one of these days God will establish kingdom in the earth and force the inhabitants of the earth into submission by issuing righteous decrees. Do we not realize that we now have a mediator of a better covenant in front of the right hand of God in the heavens, and that He has all power in heaven and in earth? To minister and to impart righteousness by the Spirit into the hearts of men here and now, is thought to be totally inadequate. I suppose because he's somebody too far away. 
we know he will rule and reign in the righteous later on for the kingdom is the everlasting kingdom but he is reigning on the throne of glory now behold the man who is named the branch and he shall grow up out of the place and he shall build the temple of the lord the christ 6 12. this man is the lord jesus he is a branch or sprout as they call him a root out of a dry ground he grew up out of the place and his place is his holy temple in the earth his place is in god's garden in God's garden, he becomes a wine. A union with a wine, there are many branches. Even he shall build the temple of the Lord, and it shall bear the glory, and shall seat and rule upon the throne. The Christ 6 13. He was the temple of God in the earth where he was there. See John the Gospel 2 19. But now he's built an extension of that temple, which he was when he walked on earth. It's not another temple, but now he is a chief cornerstone of an enlarged temple. And it bears the glory. As our great high priest in the heavens, he carries upon the shoulders the fullness of the glory of God. It reigns as a priest bearing the glory. <coughs> Excuse me. The priesthood has been transferred from earth to heaven. The so old earthly priesthood had to be changed because it was a meditation of death. The whole order ended in death because it was a earthly priesthood based upon an old covenant that even the priesthood could not keep. But now, as Christ entered into a more excellent ministry, in the heavens, a priestly ministry after the order of Melchizedek. The Lord said unto my Lord, Says I am my right hand, and to make thy enemies thine footstool. The Lord has sworn, I will not repent. Thou art the priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Psalm 110 1. And four. Why did God transfer the ministry of the priesthood from earth to heaven and from Levi to Melchizedek? Paul shows us why. One, Melchizedek is a superior to Levi because Levi paid the tithe to Melchizedek and received the blessing of Melchizedek. This proves that Melchizedek was a better because the lesser is always blessed by the better. Huh? Hebrew 7 7. To the Levitic order, good and all that it may have been its time, ended in death. And all kingdoms that end in death must give way to the kingdom of God that ensue forth in life. See Hebrews 7, 8, 16. 3. The Levitic order could not bring perfection, it could not bring the work of redemption into a completion, into a fullness, and therefore it has to be changed. See Hebrews 7, 11. And 12. Notice this, beloved, for the church to remain in the constant state for imperfection is a sound doctrine the way the church sees it. God says it had to change the old system because it could not bring forth the profession, the completion, the fullness that is brought forth in the old new covenant. 4. The old system was declared unprofitable for the simple reason that the old covenant had no power to bring forth any prophet to God, any prophet to God, O man. See Hebrews 7, 18. The law had its day, and it has demonstrated through 1,400 years of human history that the whole system ensued forth in death. Nevertheless, did they bring in a better hope by which we draw nigh to God, Hebrew. 719. The hope of the law was not another earthly kingdom. The hope of the law was a new order, was a new priesthood after the order of Melchizedek. 
This priesthood would have been administered directly from the throne of God in the heavens. The foundation of this new kingdom will be righteous and at peace. For the word name, Melchizedek, means king of righteousness. This Melchizedek reigns over the city of Salam, which means peace. We do not inquire as to who he was, this strange personage, for the secrecy of his origins make him to be a more fitting type of Christ, whom the world knows not. He is said to be without a father, without a mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life. Hebrews 7, 3. In other words, his name is nowhere to be found in the genealogies of Levitical priest records. So it is with Christ. Now Christ had a recorded genealogy in Matthew's Gospel and also in Luke's. He also had a mother and a father. But as far as the Levitical priestly record were concerned, he did not exist. He entered the sin of a priestly king ministry out from obscurity. For he came, became a king fresh from the bosom of God. And now he rose and reigns as a priest on the better throne, a inner better priesthood in the kingdom of life. What the law could not do because it was weak through the flesh. The priest on the throne of heaven is able to accomplish through the administration of the spirit to the hearts of men. Second Corinthians 3, 9, 8 and 9, Romans 8, 3. He reigns from a heavenly zone to ensure that his administration, that his ministry would be more effectual, more enduring, more progressive than it could ever be were he to minister from some geographical location on earth. Man do not think this is the best way. Most people in the church do not seem to think that is the best way, but it's saying good to God. And God ensued the greatest time of the king in the heavenly Zion. Yet I have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree. The Lord has said unto me, Thou art my son. This day and I begotten thee. Psalm 2, 6. And seven, the Hebrew five, five to six. This decree is reaffirmed again and again by God's holy apostles and prophets. And yet somehow our modern day teachers are both declared that the kingdom will not be truly effective until the heavenly Zion becomes a earthly one. God is satisfied that the king will be able to subdue all enemies under the feet and reigns from a heavenly throne. Why can't we be under arrest in the decree? And what makes us think that he is hampered in the death because it's so far away? It was here on earth once and had finished the work of redemption. He remained here for another 40 days and he could have stayed for 40 years or for 2,000 years, if that was necessary. But the decree of the Father, well, then the Son would have a, a more excellent ministry in the heavens. Hebrews 8, 6. It's all in the heavens. It would have the totality of power, not only in the earth, but in the heavens as well. Matthew 28, 18. Power in the earth would not be sufficient because the rest of the real problems was with principalities and powers in the heavens. But the real problems are with the Satan, with the prince of the power of the air, as well as the God of this world. As so God's decree has established a man in the heavens who would reign as a priest on the throne, on the highest throne to be found anywhere in the whole universe. Far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, 
not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. Ephesians 1, 21. Why do men think that coming back to earth will somehow enable him to judge more effectively because it's a transfer from heaven to earth? God transferred him from earth to heaven so he would have a more excellent ministry. Of course, he's coming back. But not to start a kingdom, he's coming to a total to totally devastate the kingdom's man, as well as all the kingdoms of heavens, and to bring to being new heavens and a new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. Second Peter three thirteen. The coming of the Lord is generally presented as the hope of the world. When the gospel of Christ will really begin to make an impact on the nations and the kingdom of heaven will be forced upon the earth by righteous decree. But it's likened his coming to the judgment of flood and the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. Matthew 24, 37 to 39, Luke 17, 28, 29. He tells us that just prior to his coming, there will be the days of full vengeance and the powers of heaven shall be shaken. Luke 21, 22, 26. Paul tells us that the Lord Jesus will come in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God, and then obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. First Thessalonians 1 8. And Peter tells us that God delay in fulfilling the promises coming is because it's a long suffering to us world, not willing that any should perish that all should come to repentance. Second Peter 3, 9. If his coming means that the earth will then be saturated with the gospel of the kingdom, why does God withhold his coming, desiring that a man would come to repentance? The reason is the day the God is at hand, a day when the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with a fervent heart, and the earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Second Peter three, ten. I'm asked, where do we fade the millennium in this picture? All I can do is ask, why didn't Peter fit in? Fit it in. We just have to leave it alone till the other pieces of the puzzle are fitted together. Somewhere that little piece of the puzzle will find its place. But are we to take the one and the only scripture in the Bible and refer to Revelation for thousand years and revolve the whole doctrine of the kingdom of God about that? Revelation 20. The book of Revelation is full of symbols, and most, if not all, of the numbers are symbolic in their significance. The only other reference to a thousand years in the New Testament is in the passage in Peter, and here would remind us that a thousand years uh, as a day, uh, but as a day. I'm now quick to point it out that the last days mentioned by the apostles have not covered two thousand years, and through the present Christian age, which era up to now is really only two days in God's calendar. So why are we not as quick to acknowledge that thousand years might be reduced to mean one day, as the apostle said? Because as to brush aside the Solomon warn is the apostle, because many theologians assured us that the new heavens, the new earth, cannot come to being for at least another thousand years. But it may not have anticipated that this age would last 2,000 years from this time. But under the inspiration of the Spirit, is that we are looking for and hastening unto the day of the Lord, which is the day of fire. Hastening unto has a meaning. Eagerly expecting, earnestly waiting for. Because the Lord comes in fire to devastate the kingdom of man. And destroy the earth and the heavens, 
as we know them, and to bring to being a new heaven and a new earth, where in dwell is righteousness. Second Peter, three twelve and the thirteen. It is now in this day that the gospel of the kingdom is to go forth to all nations, and God is preparing people for this hour. It has in any other hour for apostasy. It's the same gospel of the kingdom that went forth in the beginning, but now it is a harvest time, the end of the age. The tares are to be gathered into bundles for burning. The chairs to be separated from the wheat and consumed. The way to be gathered into the garner. The, this gospel of the kingdom will be a word that will devastate the kingdom darkness. It will be a word for salvation that will not only be spoken, but will shine to the ends of the earth. One consider the great potential that we now have for promoting the gospel with the radio and television and all kinds of electronic uh, paraphernalia. <laughs> wow, paraphernalia. <laughs> the massive missionary programs, the availability for fast communication and travel, the accumulated knowledge that now lies at our disposal by way of books and tapes and seminary seminars. All of which are designed as aid to an understanding of the scriptures, to evangelism, to and to church growth. How can we help but feel tremendously impressed with the potential of this hour for spreading of the gospel? Unless we think back about the fifty years back then, we see here status like this. One billion inhabitants of the earth either have not heard the gospel or know nothing about the Lord Jesus. Today, the number has spiraled to two or three billion, and perhaps more. And yet the church continues to exhort our modern technology as God's way to send forth the word into the earth. How blind! Does how blind can God's people get? We're not saying we should not use our modern methods of travel and communication. We're in a modern world, and we use what God has provided, as He may see fit. But we are simply saying that our technology and our modern method and aids to evangelism have no real bearing on the effect into the gospel of the kingdom. The gospel of Christ is reproductive by nature, and bring forth of this kind. Everything living, everything living, every living things that God placed in the earth was created with a law of procreation, inherent within its life itself. But I fear that church is now almost sterile because she has been drinking from a cistern that has been polluted. With the toxic wastes of the psychologies and the philosophies of men, she may be growing lips and bums in appearance anyway. Although it is evident that most of what we call church growth is simply a transfer of people from one church to another that has a better program. But how many of our church members really know the Lord? It's popular now to be born again. Because the presidents, the governors, the actors, the prominent businessmen are born again. When the stigma of the cross rooted up the church to the life of Christ, where is that trivial, trivial of the spirit that brings babies in Christ to new birth? Where is that real conviction of sin? And cause men to abhor themselves in their lost condition, and cry unto God for mercy. The church may say, "These are my children," but I wonder if God is truly saying, "I am the Father." What does God call a person that is mothered by the church, but not fathered by the Lord of the church? See Hebrews twelve eight. Jesus said, "When He, the Spirit of Truth, has come." He will reprove the world 
of sin and of righteousness and judgment. John 16, 8. How can a church that has become totally captivated by the spirit of the world become a factual reproof to the world about her? The scandal of the cross. When we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews, a stumbling block, that's Greek, scandalon, and unto the great foolishness, 1 Corinthians 1.23. Here is a real problem. God's people do not want to become the object of scandal. We do not want to be a byword, a reproach in the world that we must accommodate in order to win her favor. And so you can join the church and get away with almost anything. As long as you forsake some of those extreme outward sins that Christ, a Christian ethic do not love. But when we avoid the scandal of the cross, we are limited from our way of life. That instrument to the death that God ordained for the smiting of our carnal nature and the sinful hearts of men around us. Paul said, God forbid that I should glory, saving the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me and unto the world. Colossians 6 14. This is the other same age. The spirit of compromise is just about to conquer the people of God especially the leadership in the church today. The sad part of it all is that they are almost totally blind to their condition. And the Lord has eyes off to know in our eyes that we might see, but to be blind, and all the while insist that we see, this leaves us totally helpless and immune to any offer of salvation. Everyone is prepared to admit that the Laodicean church is the character of the end time church. But Laodicean is always that other church across the street, not the one we go to. Ours and the glorious church and Paul spoke about. And so the gospel of the kingdom continued to be heralded by a Laodicean church. A church that is based almost entirely accumulating earthly resources and getting more and more involved in earthly economics, in earthly politics, in earthly garments. A church that is rich and increased with goods. A church that promises the people of God health, prosperity, happiness, and joy. If they will but release the resources to the glory of God. A church and has perverted discipleship to mean devotion to their system rather than a forsaking of all in order to follow him. A church that considers a large financial resource to be God's provision to reach the lost rather than recognize this as a news that struck her and deprived her of the breath of life. A church that almost totally embraced the world at its systems Think that in embrace the world, she could win the world. A church that is captivated by the spirit of Jezebel, with the spirit of sorcery, seducing God's servants to commit fornication and to eat the things sacrificed unto idols. Revelation 2 22. The prophets of Jezebel and of Baal may declare some of word outstanding truths, as Balak did. But his heart was a perverse, he was doing it for the money that was in it, and God's wrath fell upon him. In the time of Ezekiel, God complained that the prophets were not preparing the people for the daily battle, nor making out the hedge of defense so the people would be able to stand in the day of the Lord, whether they were still to the people by saying peace, and there was no peace. Ezekiel 13, 1 to 16. There are many prophecies coming forth in our churches. 
for how long is it is since we have heard the prophecies that it would have caused a man to fall on his face and the secrets of the heart to made manifest and cried out God is it in you and for a truth first Corinthians 14 25 we read of men like a whistle and the fox and many others who priests in such a noise in the power that men would tremble and fall on their faces in wreathing pen because of the also in this God's holy presence. But in Pentecost was known for the fiery, consuming presence of God. Man's hearts would be smitten and the agonized under the conviction and reprove the Holy Spirit. And they want to build monuments to the memory of those great days of visitation. Spalter, spalk, sepulchers are harmless thing. We are respectful now. We are respectful now. We are respectful now. We do not want goings on like that in our churches. Why do we not seek out the old paths upon which the prophet God's glory walk in past generations? I'm afraid it is because we do not really want those cleansing streams of holy fire. A mighty joy our comfortable little dosing wheel for life. The kernel is gone. And we are content to spend our time admiring the broken shelf. We're feeding on the house and the swine do it instead of returning to Father's table. The glory has departed. It will mend the will that was rent and carry on with our worship before our ark that is devoid of the Shekinah. The altars are still there in our churches, but there is no bleeding sacrifice laid upon it. The dismembered parts of the burnt offering present too bloody a sin, with the head, the heart, and liver exposed to the holy fires of God. We must have an altar, because the altar is a part of temple worship, but let it be altar for oak or mahogany, and let it be enhanced with tapestry and golden cords, and not defiled with the smoke of a burnt offering, and not be sold with the weeping and the willing of penitent the hearts, all the grim of sinners of the street. But let us sing now. And our temples must be kept beautiful within and without to attract the crowds. The grounds must be landscaped with the art of the horticulturists because this temple is for the rich and the prosperous. No bombs are wanted in here. Our cause must be filled with the jovial, happy, praising people. No longer do we worship in blank alley missions and old storefronts. Our temples are of the best architecture and workmanship. For we are rich, increased with goods, and we need for nothing. And if perchance God prosper us, and our bonds are filled to the brim, we will sell them or tear them down and build a still greater ones to the glory of God. This ought to be Wisdom as spiritual outreach. We must build towers that reach up into the heavens and to keep the people of God from being scattered, to keep them together, to make them a one, and to make a name for ourselves. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower with the children of man built. Genesis 11 5. But it was not. The list impressed. Beloved, let's not be the list disturbed. When God began to confound, uh, to confound the languages of man and scatter the people. Let's not be concerned when the finances run low and men are forced to lay aside the plan to finish the city, the tower. God wants to know that the Most High dwells not in temple made with hands, 
the horseman. Is the only dwelling place that God has ever desired for his habitation. Don't be surprised when the Lord of glory walks in the midst of the church today and over through the tables of money changers. Don't try to arrange the table just because you have brought and paid for one of them. And don't blame it on the devil either. It's God that is saying, Make not my father's horse a horse of a merchandise. It's God saying, you know, sat long enough in your comfort of pews, trying to sing the song of the Lord in a strange land. I will return your captivity. I will bring you out of Babylon. I will lead you back to Zion, the city of the living God. Can we not hear the call to repentance in this awesome hour? I know. And that I need a cold, no heart, or without word cold heart. Then because I look warm, I need a cold heart, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because I say this, I'm rich, increase with the goods, I'm in need of nothing. And no, it is not. That art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. I counsel thee to buy and make good trial in the fire, and thou mayest be rich, a wide raiment, and thou mayest be clothed. And then the shame thy nakedness do not appear, and not thy eyes with eye shelves, and thy made us see as many as a love. I rebuke and taste them. Be zealous of all. I repent. Romans 3 15 to 19. I saw our Lord. Stand outside the door, still knocking and asking for an admission, admittance. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hears my voice and open the door, I will come in to him, will sup with him, and he with me. Revelation 3.20 a staff, a pair of sandals, and a coat. This was God's provision for the first preachers of the gospel of the kingdom that Jesus sent forth. And he commanded them that they should take nothing for their journey. See, a staff only, no scripts, no bread, no money in the purse, and be shod with the sandals, and not put on two coats. Mark 6, 8, and 9. I know we live in a different time. But not also that. Nine says everything seems to be in this jet age, age of sandalites and dishes. We have become completely burdened down within the system that requires an awful lot of entanglements from the pilgrim people. Let's not think for one moment the kingdom of God is in any way dependent upon the modern resources of man and all the electronic gang gangentry we use what God provides. But when all the machinery of our modern way of life has been swept away, the propagation of the gospel of the Christ will not suffer because of it. Our real shoes are not the sandal we wear, but the shoes is the preparation of the gospel peace. The staff in our is not all that we really need. A real scepter is that which come from him who is the king of kings and lord of lords. A real coat consists of the garments of righteousness, the broader coat of priestly ministry, with air fight about our wrist and the mitra of the holiness upon our head. Any provision we need along 
our pilgrim way, God will be fit to provide a real provision in the fact that He sends us. But if He sends, He's responsible for our welfare. We simply go as a pilgrims, as ambassadors with a message from heaven. Drop the seed into the hearts of men and trust God to water and cultivate and care for the green plant and bring forth fruit for His glory. The Church of Christ is self propagating. Man's way to build the temple and bond to store the seed. But God's way to scatter it, the heathen reaches. He said, it will cut away, cut, cut away the course of Zion's king. Will scatter the people far and wide, but they fulfill God's purpose in doing it. But they realize that in their fanatic effort to eradicate the church, they were actually planting the seeds of the kingdom of God in all parts of the land. They did not know that here was a self propagating, reproductive people that would reproduce their kind in the good soil of the a famishing, hungry world. Did not know that as they were dealing with the kings, whose the scepter was only a staff, but who moves in the authority of the king of the universe. The sandals of the wall were the shoes of preparation of the gospel of peace. And the code was the garment of truth in which they laid, and by which they spoke a word that was sharper than any two double edged sword. Not the purpose of true ministry to us. So fed the sheep of God's pasture that they will become strong, vital, healthy, and reproductive. We have all kinds of sheep factories about us, and they are using all kinds of gimmicks, rock music, entertainment, dance tropes. Uh, what? Dance tropes? Pantomime? I don't know. You name it. To make the church productive. But in fact, it's making her sterile. But God in this hour is going to raise up shepherd after his own heart, who made his life to the sheep, so they will be able to bring forth after their kind. They come up from the washing, where love everyone bears twins, and now is bearing among them. Son of, uh, of the Psalm, Psalms 4 2. What do you suppose would happen if every one of God's sheep were to bear twins? Twins that is are also vital, strong, healthy, and reproductive. Let's start with just a small flock, a very small flock. Let's start with one wild creature in each town city in the world. Just one. I believe there are at least 150,000 villages, towns, and cities in the world. So we have just 150,000 real Christians in the earth. Now let's give every one of these wider Christians a whole day to bring another to the Lord. So now there are two in each of these villages, both strong, vital, healthy ship. The next day, the number of the previous day doubles to four. And the next day is double to eight, and so forth. Should that seem too difficult? How long then do you suppose it would take to fill the whole world with strong, vital, healthy creations? It's just about two weeks, that's all. It's slightly over two weeks, the whole world has been saturated with the gospel of the kingdom. And all this by word of mouth, from one neighbor to another, without the use of any other means of communication. One day, of course, might be crowding it a little, <laughs> crowding it a little. Let's make it a week for each one to produce, and then doubling again the next week, and the next for well, fifteen weeks, and the week, and the work is accomplished in about the four months. Or give them a month, and the work is accomplished over a year. Every sheep of God's pants is responsible for bringing one more into the life of Christ in each of these periods. And the whole world is filled with real Christians in 15 days, or 15 weeks, or 15 months. So the case may be.
We're talking about a vital church, about true disciple of Christ, living and walking in the principles of the kingdom of heaven. I'm not suggesting that this may be God's plan. I'm simply using it as a nutrition of God's way. Uh, it has a formula. Basically, start with 150,000, then multiply by many twos. Eventually, equivalent approximately 5 million, billion. So, and the Lord entered the church daily as it should be saved, as 247. The number of the disciples multiplied as 6 1. And the word of God increased, and the number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly, as 6 7. But the word of God grew and multiplied, as 12 24. And at the same time, there was a great persecution. They were all scattered abroad except the apostles. They then were scattered abroad when everywhere preaching the word, as 8, 1 to 4. The apostle remained in Jerusalem, and the people that were scattered and sowed the seed of the kingdom throughout the land. God, the church, has been giving inherent life from God to reproduce herself in the church. All of this may sound very unrealistic for today. It's all because of very unreal church refused to acknowledge her sterile condition, so then rather to carry on with her fruitless programs instead of calling a halt to the whole thing, urging her members, her members to carry to cry unto God for reality. When are we going to realize that we are the church, and that the building has nothing to do with it? Oh yes, we are sure. Everybody knows that. But if they do, why are they still building God's temple to the glory of God on the plains of the sinner? And giving them such reverence and honor. And why can't God's people walk away from it all when the glory of God departed? Simply because this is my church. I was raised here. I helped pay for it. The gaps in the early church were marked by the simplicity and the continuous defense sitting in the apostle doctrine and the fellowship and in breaking bread at the emperors at 2.42. Their home became their meeting places and this became the wonderful gathering together when churches began to spring up throughout the empire. If they had no home, they would meet wherever they could. There was the church. They needed fellowship. And they recognized that if there were two of them, they would have fellowship. And they said to the temple in Jerusalem for no season. But when persecution arose, this facility was no longer available. In Jerusalem, they may have met in hundreds of homes. And there were one because they walked in truth. And the Lord Jesus was present in their midst. For he promised that where two or three will get together in his name, it will be there in their midst. Matthew 18, 20. It was not encouraging the little handful that would gather on the Wednesday night. It was talking about the power of the kingdom that binds the forces of evil and loses the forces of heaven. When the two people are in harmony in the spirit, and the Lord Jesus is a Lord in their midst. The handful meeting in this home, another handful were there. What more could the Lord desire? What if we have two hundred such a homes, three hundred, four hundred, filled with people who have come together for fellowship? With the Lord is in their midst, in the fullness of the presence. We see we see these things to encourage God's people in this day. When man's programs are crumbling, we're not saying we can't rent or build a structure for some kind if God gives clear direction in that manner. We're simply saying that all of this is totally incidental. We use what God may provide according to his will. But we must be prepared to drop it all at a moment's notice. He wants us 
to be pilgrim in character, self-appropriating and reproductive by nature, and to be assured that the buildings and temples have nothing to do with the gospel of the kingdom of God. God is going to bring forth this kind of a people in the earth. And again, do it very quickly. Even so, come Lord Jesus. But it may take the fires, the trials, the persecution to bring about. I recall the feeling for despair that swept over the church here in the West. When the doors were closed to missionary works in China. Can we not believe that King Jesus has a killer David? That he openeth and no man shutteth, and shutteth and no man openeth? Revelation 3, 7. So when the door to China were closed, God began a great work of purification and refining. And through much trial and suffering, has come forth in that great land a strong, healthy, self-propagating church. In recent years, a little help has come from the outside, but the church in China is not dependent upon any of this. To know this could change any time. And they have proved God to be faithful in the past, to raise up in their own midst whatever ministry they needed. They have comparatively few Bibles, and not much by way of Christian literature. They meet whenever they can, in the field, among the trees, on the streets, but generally in their homes. All this is quite incidental because they recognize that they are the church. And it grows and grows and grows because of Christ Jesus in their midst as a Lord and a King.